Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopez, and today I'm joined again by Dr. Chiara Marletto. Uh, she has just published a new book, The Science of Ken and Kent, A Physicist's Journey Through the Land of Counterfactuals, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So, Dr. Marletto, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you for having me. Okay, so uh, let's start perhaps with a basic question and going right to the subtitle of your book. What are counterfactuals? Um, I think there are a number of different uh, meanings for the world for the word counterfactual. Um, some of them come from mathematics, um, logic. Others come from philosophy. Um, but in my book, I think I'm using the word in a, a specific sense, which is relevant for physics, and a slightly different sense from these uh, different other meanings. Um, so what I mean by a counterfactual statement is um, a statement that refers to things that uh, could or could not be, as opposed to a statement that is about stuff that is. So I'll give you an example to clarify what I mean by that. Um, so if you think of uh, the way science and physics specifically describes the world, uh, the first approximation, the first uh, way of describing um, things within physical laws is to state what happens to physical objects uh, when they move through space-time. And so in a way, there is um, a set of uh, conditions that we can call initial conditions uh, such as initial velocity and position of, uh, say, um, a ball that's about to be kicked by a, uh, by, by a, by a tennis racket, for example. Um, and then this, uh, there is a description of how this object moves in space and time. So in this case, the trajectory of the ball according to, say, the laws of um, motion a la Newton, for example. Um, so this is all about what happens. But there are other things that you can mention in the explanation for why a certain trajectory happens versus another. And the things that you mention in this explanation are not necessarily all about what happens. They are about deeper things. And sometimes they're about what could or could not happen. And so the idea is that, for example, certain aspects of the motion of the ball can be explained through a statement about conservation of energy which um, is expressed in terms of um, uh, the fact that it is impossible to build a perpetual motion machine of the first kind. And the statement is about what's impossible to, um, to make happen, as opposed to what doesn't happen or uh, what does happen. So this is an example of a counterfactual statement, the fact that a perpetual motion machine is impossible. And it's part of the explanation for why certain trajectories are what they are once you put some initial conditions. So these are the counterfactuals that count for physics. And those are the ones that I'm talking about in the book. Mm -hmm. So, but if something is possible to happen, can we say that it exists? Uh, so the, 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 that is, isn't necessarily the case. So, for example, uh, you could say that um, it is possible to build a, um, for example, a computer. That could be one consequence of the laws of physics. But that doesn't mean the computer will ever be built. So there could be trajectories of, of the universe where um, a perfect computer can, you know, a, a computer can never, is, is actually never built. But still, it could be possible. This would mean that there could be other trajectories um, of the universe which don't are not realized um, on which the computer is actually built to a certain accuracy. Uh, but I think the um, so the statement that something is possible doesn't necessarily mean that it will happen um, given some initial conditions. So that's the that's the other subtle aspect that the possibility of something refers to the counterfactual um, um, potential. Um, aspect of this of this object, and not to the fact that it will really happen necessarily under our laws of physics. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about what is and isn't possible, are we just referring to things that 
uh, are not designed or are we also including the ones that are designed like for example the things that humans create in culture and things like that uh, so it's very nice that you're bringing in this notion of design because let me clarify it uh, slightly that um, it's again it's a, it's a loaded word that's being used in different ways uh, in different fields um, the way I'm using it in the book is uh, to ref in, in a way the same way that evolutionary biology um, has been using this word to indicate um, the uh, well the, the, the appearance of um, certain aggregates of matter that exist in the universe um, to be uh, highly uh, fine-tuned for a specific purpose, for a specific function. For example, you can think uh, an organism like um, a cell has different uh, subparts that are all uh, coordinated to perform the same functionalities, the most important of which is the fact that the cell has to self-reproduce. And um, if you slightly vary some of these subparts, you, um, you are in trouble with the functionality of the whole. And that's one feature of objects with the appearance of design. Now, um, these objects, like computers and like things that civilization can create, are uh, subject to the laws of physics, naturally. And the reason why we find them interesting is that unlike elementary things such as particles and elementary interactions um, are not directly explained by the elementary um, laws of motion that, that we know for the universe. And so they require some additional explanation, which in the case of the objects I mentioned, comes from biological uh, evolutionary, the theory of evolution that Darwin proposed and then was perfected later by uh, theoretical biologists. Um, and and so the um, when we say that something is possible, an object of a certain kind is possible. For example, a computer. Again, um, we are referring implicitly to the fact that the evolutionary process that brings about that object is permitted by the laws of physics. And so we are requiring that um, uh, some particular a uh, process such as natural selection is allowed, and this requires that the laws of physics have certain features, for example, that they allow for information and for other things uh, that are relevant for natural selection to occur. Uh, and these are all um, things that do not require a designer, so they are things that um, are completely agnostic about the particular object that's being created, uh, for example, the computer in question. Um, at least up to the point where civilization is, is, is constructed, because then civilization can create the knowledge to create the computer. Um, but they are, so the, these aspects of the physical laws are um, important because they, they, they are regularities, they're important for physics, but that, because they're regularities um, uh, that, that uh, exist in our universe and must be expressed, and they can be expressed through, counter, through counterfactuals. But they need not exist. So we could imagine easily a universe where some of the regularities that are kind of permit things like evolution and, and natural selection uh, are just not there. And so the part of the physics of counterfactuals is um, to try and explain more of these regularities in the laws of nature that permit uh, things like life and related um, designed um, entities to appear in a in a universe where there's no designer and there's no prearranged um, uh, you know manufacturer who is creating the universe and and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So does the physics of counterfactuals also take into account the possibility of other universes existing with other laws of physics, for example? Yes, um, I think that's a very nice question. Um, it's, it's a very interesting thing that when you formulate laws, um, you, you have to, when, when you try to explain something, to, to, to formulate a law to explain a physical phenomenon that you see in front of your eyes, uh, you have to necessarily contemplate other ways in which laws could be so that you can rule those out 
and um, part of the explanation that you create for what you see is exactly in ruling those other possibilities out. So uh, again, an example from uh, from biology, um, you you know you can explain um, how uh, turns out that there are uh, two different genders um, and not three or four for, uh, say, certain organisms in the biosphere. Um, because if you were to think of three or four or five or whatever, um, certain aspects of, uh, you know, mating and, and, and having offsprings, etc., would be more complex and it would create more problems and so on. So in a way, you can come up with an explanation for why the you know natural selection came up with this particular choice uh, through contemplating what would have happened if you had different um, different choices in place. Uh, so that's kind of a simple example from from biology, uh, but this is true in physics. It's true in other disciplines as well. And I think in the specific case of the physics of counterfactual, the laws that we come up with, which are about uh, can and can't statements, so they are about possible and impossible um, transformations and so on. Um, are formulated also by contemplating other universes where these laws are um, not obeyed. And uh, so the, the reason why we rule those things out, those universes out, is part of the um, uh, explanatory power of these laws that we, that we put forward. So yeah, by all means, I think this is not just a feature of the physics of Ken and Kant. I think in general, um, laws uh, of physics and of other disciplines have an explanatory content which is in what they forbid and so therefore you have to think of what would have happened if those laws were not in place to understand why those laws are actually the right ones to explain a specific situation. Mm -hmm. Are there specific physical phenomena? Uh, I think that in the, book you, in the book you talk about, for example, work and heat that we can shed new light into by applying the physics of counterfactuals? Yes, I think there are a number of these phenomena and this one of the reasons why um, the, this theory that I'm pursuing uh, with my collaborators in Oxford and uh, that was initially kind of suggested by, by David Deutsch, who was a computer pioneer, quantum computer pioneer. Um, so th this is one of the reasons why this theory is, was created in the first place to incorporate um, some of these phenomena that currently appear to be problematic. They, they don't quite fit into the way we, um, we do physics in the traditional way. And by that I mean that, uh, so when you consider, uh, for example, heat and work, they are completely described by uh, thermodynamical laws that exist and they, these laws were proposed um, at, let's say, at the phenomenological level to illustrate the behavior of um, engines, thermal engines, and, and so on, when they uh, were invented. Um, but then, uh, so these laws remained in some sense uh, at this level of being capable of describing macroscopic objects, so objects that exist at our scale. But when you're going uh, into smaller and smaller scales and down to the elementary constituents of these objects, it's well known that the behavior that the thermodynamic laws require, for example, the existence of some kind of irreversibility, uh, which is related to the fact that when you transform work into heat, um, you lose something and, and there is a sort of irreversible process that happened that uh, doesn't allow you to transfer uh, to transform back the whole of the heat that you create into work. So this irreversibility seems to lose meaning when you consider elementary constituents of the thermal engines that I was talking about earlier, because the, there you just use these laws of motion that are perfectly reversible, and so you, don't, you no longer have this, um, this uh, irreversibility that's prescribed by the second law. So the usual conclusion at this point is to say that uh, the thermodynamic laws are emergent, so they are approximative, uh, they are useful you know, for certain purposes, but not really fundamental laws. They're not as exact and universal as, say, uh, Newton's laws, uh, 
uh, one square and uh, as, as say uh, quantum theories and general relativity and so on. And the science of Ken and Kant um, comes in with the idea of um, proposing a, an alternative to this conclusion, which is that while still holding that the microscopic laws are reversible, so we are not denying that, um, you can express by using counterfactuals, you can express the second law and the behavior of heat and work um, through counterfactuals in an exact way. And I think uh, this is very interesting because it allows you to um, uh, basically formulate this, the requirement of irreversibility at a different level of explanation that's compatible with the underlying irreversib sorry, reversibility of the dynamical laws. Um, but exists at this, this higher level of abstraction of the counterfactual world. And um, it's compatible with the underlying microscopic dynamics. Um, and at the same time, it's also useful to um, extend the current second law into uh, scales, microscopic scales that um, at the moment are just not, um, that they're not within the domain of the, of the, of the traditional second law. So in this sense, I think heat and work are a, an example of this phenomenon that if you insist on using just trajectories and statements about what happens uh, in physics, you will only capture approximately. But if you switch to the counterfactual laws, you're able to capture exactly. And uh, this is true also for phenomena to do with life and information. And these things are all connected within this uh, new approach that I am pursuing. Mm -hmm. So, when we talk about counterfactuals, are there different sets of counterfactuals that apply in different uh, levels of analysis? Like, for example, when we're talking about quantum systems, are there specific counterfactuals that go associated with them? Yes. Um, so, I guess the, so the counterfactuals associated with quantum physics, with quantum systems, um, are somehow uh, related to the counterfactuals that underlie information theory. And this is because, as was uh, proven by the um, quantum theory of information, the deepest structure of quantum theory is um, expressible in a very crisp and clear way by uh, talking about the information theoretic structure of, of these quantum systems. So you can forget about most of the details of quantum theory and just concentrate on the information theoretic structure of these systems and then you extract most of the features of, of what quantumness means. Um, and so in the specific case, the, 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 so a classical object from the information theoretical point of view is an object that can um, that has a set of states, uh, like a bit, uh, that can be um, permuted in all possible ways, so transformed into each other in all possible ways, and copied. So for the bit, in, in specifically, you have zero and one as the two possible states. And as you know, when you have a bit, you can flip zero into one, so you can transform these two states into each other. Um, you can leave them alone. Um, so fix zero and fix one, and you can copy them. So if you have another bit, you can set up a system that copies zero into the second bit and one into the second bit from the first one. So um, this is a classical information system. But uh, quantum systems um, have this very interesting feature that they can be used as bits. So they all have these properties that I just said. But they also have an additional property, which is also counterfactual, um, that has to do with the fact that um, quantum systems have properties that can be observed, so they can contain information, but uh, they cannot be observed uh, jointly to the same arbitrarily high accuracy. The classic example is, um, is the case of position and momentum for, or velocity for an electron. We know that uh, you can observe, you can create a, a measurer, an observer of um, position that works really uh, to arbitrarily high accuracy. But once you have that, 
that same object can't work in order to measure velocity and vice versa. And I think um, this is called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It's like the pillar of quantum theory. And turns out it's about counterfactuals because it's telling you that you cannot um, use both position and momentum jointly to store information. So you can make a bit out of position and a bit out of momentum for, of the same quantum system. But if you try to put these two bits together, you won't get um, uh, two bits of information. You can only either use uh, one or the other, can never use them together. And I think this is um, about a very fundamental impossibility in the um, information theoretic uh, capacities of, of a quantum system, which very interestingly is the very reason why uh, quantum systems are actually more powerful um, from the information theoretic point of view. And this is um, possible to see when you put together two quantum systems, this impossibility at the level of each of them results in more possibilities as, at the joint level, for example, with the phenomena of, of entanglement. So the counterfactuals are really key to explain uh, not just quantum theory, but also the, the information theoretic um, additional power of, of quantum computing. Mm -hmm. So, and from this perspective, the perspective of counterfactuals, what is knowledge exactly? Um, so, knowledge is uh, related to uh, information. In fact, it's a special case of information. Um, now, information is this thing that is um, in, contained by objects that have this property of being, of having states that are permutable in all possible ways and copied. So that's one way of defining information implicitly by talking about the properties of the physical supports for it, the counterfactual properties of these physical supports for information. Uh, once you do that, then you, you notice that there are um, different kinds of information. So this is, I think this is already known informally. Uh, we, so I think both in biology and computer science, um, there is um, a general statement about the fact that some kinds of information are more useful. So, for example, in, an, uh, in a, a genetic code, there are bits of the genetic code that are coding for traits that help a specific um, organism to be more fit to the environment. And ultimately, this means that these specific bits of the genetic code are these uh, selfish genes that, are, that kind of can survive more easily in the specific environment and can replicate themselves more efficiently. Now these are, uh, these genes contain a kind of information that's very useful in that context, whereas other bits of the genetic uh, material that's inside the cell are completely useless. Some of them are there just as junk or, or they, they don't have a specific function and so on. And so that is still information, but it's not as useful. It doesn't have um, the, specifically, it doesn't have a, a particular ability, which is the ability to um, maintain itself in existence. So this is information that is in the useful uh, genes, in the, in the um, uh, successful genes, is an example of information that is capable of maintaining itself instantiated in physical systems. And this is um, what we call knowledge. So it's information which uh, we can label as useful. And by that, we mean the information that has an additional counterfactual property, which is the ability to remain embodied in physical systems. Um, and uh, so now the genetic information I mentioned is not the only example. You can think of... Um, an example of this information as being contained in the um, in the um, in the knowledge that's could, could produced by our civilization. So some bits of the knowledge we produced as you know humans as we were improving um, have the property has the property of being capable of remaining embodied in physical systems, and also enables our own survival in the sense that it helps us finding better ways of existing in this universe, uh, defending ourselves from various threats and so on. So knowledge is this particular kind of information that has this additional counterfactual ability of uh, being resilient. 
Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the genetic code and I wanted to ask you a specific question about biology. So in the book you present this concept of resilience. How does it apply to biology? Uh, so this is a, a very deep question and um, it's a question that is both for biologists and physicists I would say uh, because um, I think there's been a lot of conceptual work in trying to pin down what are the properties that distinguish uh, alive matter from inanimate matter and I think there's there are um, several uh, several books and, and um, um, various papers written about this and yet I don't think from the at least from the physics point of view I don't think we have a conclusive answer to that question in the sense that surely we can tell when something is alive uh, but if you you know it's a bit like time uh, that when you when you ask some you know when you ask someone uh, to define what it means to be alive then they, they have no answer for it uh, or they have many different answers and so in that sense it's an open problem now um, the, the the importance of um, counterfactuals and knowledge for specifically for biological systems um, comes exactly in this context of trying to find a theoretical foundation for um, expressing the physical properties that make something alive distinct from something that isn't. Um, and the, the, the fact that it contains knowledge um, is one it's a necessary thing, um, it, it's, it's a feature that is necessary for, for a certain object to be labeled as, as alive in some sense. Um, and note that this is weird because it would, you know, it would classify a car as being alive even though it doesn't quite um, appear as an organism, uh, but it's part of what the, um, uh, you know, our civilization has constructed in order to survive. So it's, in a sense, it's alive in this sense. It's kind of a byproduct of natural selection plus our thinking. Um, now, this is all connected with resilience because um, if you look at all the tasks that are being performed by uh, living systems um, to maintain themselves in existence, these tasks um, are First of all, they are, they are tasks that don't uh, happen spontaneously by just letting the laws of physics unfold. So they are not um, encoded in the elementary symmetries and, and um, interactions that are uh, spontaneously occurring through the laws of physics. Um, so despite being compatible with this underlying elementary structure, they're not directly explained by, by, by those laws. And at the same time, um, these tasks happen to a very high degree of accuracy. So in our civilization, we've managed to uh, perfect processes such as exactly constructing a car, for example, that occur uh, very accurately, very reliably, and so on. And likewise, if you take a much less developed form of life, let's say a bacterium, uh, it too has um, perfected a way of, of self-reproducing, which is um, extremely accurate. It's got error correction, it's got all of these other mechanisms that ensure that um, this process of creating a new cell from the first, from, from a former cell, happens quite reliably. And if you look at all of these processes, all of these tasks, you will see that um, there is always an object that comes with them that is um, uh, enabling their uh, occurrence. And this object can be thought of as a catalyst, uh, a thing that um, causes these transformations to occur and stays itself after this has happened. So just like a catalyst with uh, chemicals, in this sense, this is a, a generalized uh, concept of catalyst. It's an object that um, in, 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 my, in my field, we would call it a constructor. It's an object that can um, accept in input something, transform it into something else, and retain the ability to do this over and over again. Now, this object is resilient and also contains knowledge. So these are two facts that are uh, common to all of these tasks that are important for life 
and they are associated with living entities. Um, and um, at the same time are also tasks that do not directly emerge from the symmetries, the underlying elementary symmetries of the laws of physics. So this is how knowledge and resilience are both um, key to explain how um, uh, certain behaviors that are characteristic of living beings, specifically the ability of performing tasks reliably, can come about even though these tasks are not elementary, they are not um, uh, simple from the point of view of physics. So they are not included in the elementary set of interactions that the physical laws that say uh, should happen spontaneously when you let um, objects just um, scatter of each other. So in this sense, that's why resilience is relevant for life, because I would say it's a necessary component of this these various objects that we can call constructors that must exist uh, whenever there is a task that is performed reliably and this task isn't elementary from the point of view of physical laws. And so happens that life is based on performing lots of these tasks that are not elementary from the point of view of physical laws. One key example is self-reproduction of a very complex entity such as cell. Mm -hmm. Are psychological phenomena things that also the science of counterfactuals take into account? I mean, is there something new that the science can shed light on when it comes to psychological phenomena? Um, I think there, uh, there are um, uh, some uh, phenomena that... Um, are include so I think th th this isn't something that we can uh, quite explain yet. So it's not. This is a very speculative type of question. But I think certainly having a handle on knowledge, which is the main byproduct, the main product of um, thinking, um, which is key to to consciousness and to the you know to a con to what a conscious entity does, having a handle on knowledge which is objective and doesn't rely on the existence of uh, observers or sentient beings, or it's just talked about in terms of this resilience and the ability to, um, to do um, you know, certain uh, transformations reliably and so on, is um, a first step towards building a physical theory of these phenomena. So although we don't, I don't think we have that yet, um, what we are hoping is that constructor theory or the science of Ken and Kant can actually provide the conceptual basis for um, for a theory of such objects of, of, of all of these phenomena that are associated with consciousness and thinking. I was asking about psychological phenomena. Um, is it possible to understand or do you think it will ever be possible to understand these kinds of phenomena by reducing them to physics? Are you a reductionist in any way or not? Uh, I think I am a reductionist in the sense of um, expecting that this phenomena can be fully explained within physics. So in that sense, I, I think that um, we don't have yet a good explanation for this phenomena in the sense that we don't understand how they work um, at the fundamental level, but there will be a theory of, of, of this kind. However, I don't expect it to be an explanation in terms of the standard traditional physics. So I don't expect uh, this phenomena to be reducible to um, statements about trajectories of elementary particles. So although I know that I, I expect thinking to be perfectly compatible with the fact that our brain is um, ruled at the microscopic level by all of these laws of quantum theory and uh, other uh, you know, various dynamical laws we have for describing uh, particles that compose our brain, I don't expect that the explanation about the brain will be given in terms of those. So we will need new additional tools and counterfactuals are one of those tools. Um, it's a bit like when you ask, um, you know, the, the, so you, you can ask why is it that, I, I give this example in the book, that why is it the transistor off in a particular uh, computational step when a computer is executing a certain computation? You can give two explanations for that, you know, can, can give two answers to that question. One is to say, well, it's off because 
the electrons that compose the currents um, in the transistor uh, were set to these particular initial conditions and now working out all the dynamical laws, we see that this particular transistor must be off at this point. Uh, that's an okay answer, it's true, but it doesn't quite explain, it doesn't answer the question I asked because the, the right answer is given in, term, not in terms of electrons, is given in terms of uh, well, the reason why that's off is that we are factoring a specific number. The computer is loaded with a program that's factoring a number, and uh, you know the inputs were the input was for 15, and and now uh, this particular transistor encodes the number uh, three, which is one of the factors. And the the this answer is also true, and I think it's the most explanatory out of the two answers. And it's needed to, under to answer the question. And I think it's of this kind, it's, this is the kind of answer that, uh, this is the kind of explanation that will be required to explain this psychological, uh, I mean, generically speaking, the consciousness realm of, of phenomena. Um, and we still need to build the theory for that. For that. So it will be completely compatible with the underlying microscopic dynamics, but it won't be reducible to it. Mm -hmm. And in the realm of physics, do you think that the science of can and can't can help us unify quantum mechanics with the general theory of relativity or not? Um, so I think the um, it's interesting how these things are very. This could be a good a good joke, uh, you know, because we were talking about AIs and and consciousness. So um, yes, so delete that. Uh, so I think the. Um, Building a theory that merges um, that merges um, quantum theory and general relativity is not a, an immediate goal of, of constructor theory. Um, however, I think the, 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 the constructor theory allows us to dig uh, deep in the structure of both quantum theory and hopefully of general relativity as well in the sense that it can capture, just like quantum information theory captured the very essence of quantum theory, uh, it can um, capture the, some kind of hidden symmetry, some underlying symmetry of um, given dynamical laws. And in that sense, I think it's very helpful to provide um, some kind of guidelines, some general principles that can, um, can help us guess what the new theory might look like. So, at the moment, the, the searches that, that the various proposals for quantum gravity that we have are based on um, merging the two theories in, uh, for example, at the formal level, uh, and, and um, this has led to some proposals and so on. But somehow the theory of Kahn and Kant will provide some uh, higher level, meta level uh, kind of uh, help because it will give us some general principles that should constrain also this, this new theory. So in that sense, it will help us throw out some of the guesses uh, because they clash with some of these principles in the same way that, say, thermodynamics has also guided us in the past to make um, conjectures about future laws of physics. And in a sense, um, this was in a very different context, but let's say Einstein, when he was trying to put together his theory of special relativity, he also was guided by principles in making his guess. So likewise, I think the principles of, of constructor theory will help us in, in, in the search for the next theory in the same way. Mm -hmm. So uh, now this is more of a philosophical question, but do you think that the science of counterfactuals would change the way philosophers think about uh, things like epistemology and metaphysics? That is a very interesting question. I think um, my guess is uh, that it will. Um, and I think, or at least uh, it, it will provide more food for thought for, for, for philosophers who are interested in these type of issues, because um, it one key thing that happens with constructor theory or the sense of Ken and Kant is that you um, take some uh, very different uh, primitive elements for your explanations. So instead of taking as primitive elements the 
elementary particles and the trajectories uh, dictated by the laws of motion and initial conditions, you take counterfactuals as being your fundamental building blocks. And this is interesting because um, by making this switch, you suddenly can have laws that are exact about entities that by using the uh, formal conception of physics, the traditional conception of physics, are inherently approximate and emergent and, and not fundamental. So somehow, the, I can see here an interesting epistemological statement about scientific theories that um, you can have explanatory theories that take different elements as primitive, and in those, uh, you know, in, 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 in these different cases, you will see that different laws can be formulated exactly, and then the question is, what would what 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 counts as fundamental in this context? Uh, you know, is it that we want to still think that fundamental laws are only those that refer to elementary particles because that gives us a more uh, you know satisfactory grip on the elementary components of matter, or can we count as fundamental also these other laws that use counterfactuals because they are still explanatory, they are still they have predictive power and they are testable and so on, they're just formulated in a different way. And I think so this might be actually opening a very interesting discussion within the epistemology community. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, yeah. And when it comes specifically to science, do you think it would change the way we do science or think about it or something like that? Um, I guess he won't change it fundamentally in the form of we'll still follow the same method of, you know, conjectures and refutations and, and uh, using tests of various kinds to, to discard theories that don't appear to work and, and so on. Um, but I think he will, if, if the theory works, it will change, um, I, I guess it will change our conception of what counts as a fundamental law. So again, it's a bit like what I said earlier that um, currently there is, at least in the traditional um, physics community, there is a, um, an implicit assumption that the only fundamental laws can be formulated in terms of these trajectories and laws of motion, etc. And all the others like conservation of energy, thermodynamics and so on, they are only um, maybe accessory or they are useful as manner of discourse, but they're not really ultimately fundamental. They are not um, essential. And um, I think this um, theory, if it works and it will help us making progress in some uh, areas as it has already done in some way, um, will modify this view and it will show that it's actually misconceived and that um, you can formulate fundamental laws, exact laws, by taking different elements as primitives, in this case, counterfactuals. So in that sense, I guess it will change maybe the flexibility that we have in using, um, you know, in, in, in formulating laws and not just sticking to a specific paradigm that's been successful so far, but doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that it has to be the only paradigm that we can use in order to make progress in physics. And since we're talking about science, what is the relationship between predictions and explanations and why do we need both? Ah, that's a very nice uh, question. I think the, so the prediction of a theory is usually, at least in physics, the, the thing that people put most, uh, mo mostly the emphasis when they are explaining the scientific method because um, it's the thing that allows us to then test the theory. So you could have, uh, the prediction is um, a statement about something that will happen according to the specific theory that you uh, consider. And it's useful because if you perform an experiment and the prediction is borne out, then you can say that your theory is still non-problematic. And if it's not borne out, then you can make, put, you know, start questioning your theory and try to change it. But the prediction itself isn't, um, the most important part of the theory. Uh, so it's useful because it's allowing us to test theories, but the most interesting part of the theory is the explanation, the underlying explanation for this prediction. So the, 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 the standard examples are things to do with the motion of, star, of the stars and of the planets. 
I think um, there are rec um, records of early humans even uh, um, uh, compiling lists of where you know stars would be next so they noticed that there was a regularity in the motion of the stars and the planets in the star in the sky and they thought they could make some predictions and some of them actually there were some calendars based on these regularities etc um, but the explanation for why that was wasn't good enough it, we, we you know they didn't have what we now know they didn't have the theory of gravitation they didn't have um, our explanation for why actually the the planets appear to move in the way that they do um, and so it's only when the um, better explanation came about with uh, Galileo and uh, what party Kepler and Newton and so on that we could put together uh, a much more far-reaching set of predictions so you see in these two cases you had uh, two uh, predictions that are mostly about the same thing which is the motion of the planets and stars um, except that the explanations for the two predictions is very different and the um, uh, value of the theory is all in the explanatory part of the theory because it's the thing that gives reach to the theory it gives it uh, you know the capacity of being universal and clearly newton's laws which are the underlying explanation for our current understanding um, for our not current but let's say for the modern understanding of of the planetary motions were actually far more universal than the original explanations that the um, that people had in antiquity and newton's laws themselves were less universal than uh, GR's explanation, uh, which actually is actually the, the current best way of understanding gravitation uh, and so on. And maybe there will be a better way. No doubt there will be a better explanation. So I think the both, so the predictions are somehow only instrumentally uh, relevant for the theory because they are the things through which most of the times we test the theory, but the underlying important bits uh, of the theory um, are the explanations that come with it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how can we have a complete account of what can and cannot be? Because aren't we, at least to some extent, limited to what we can experience happening? I think this is a, a good question. And um, I would say that the same issue applies to the standard uh, traditional conception of physics in a way that there too, you could say, we are, um, you know, the, the, the sort of premise of all our, of our, all of, all of our um, endeavors to understand the universe is that we interface ourselves with the universe through our own senses, primarily. Um, so in that sense, if there is a limitation coming from that, will be the same for all the explanatory modes that we may think of. Um, and in regard to that, I... I think that specifically for the science of Ken and Kant, the idea is that um, if there is a reason why, let's say, there is a limitation to things we can know, so, you know, there is like a set of things that are unknowable for, for some reason, then um, there should be a law of physics that says why that is. So in that sense, uh, and that law of physics will be about something that's impossible. And so, um, in that sense, it would be interesting to think of what that law might be. I don't think there is one, but supposing there is one, that law will come with an explanation and it will tell us something about the universe in a way that will allow us to understand more about it. So in this sense, I don't see it as a, um, this, this fact is not a threat to the program of specifically of, of the theory that I'm advocating, because um, even it could be incorporated through a law which is basically a counterfactual law and even that would be useful to understand the universe better than we do now mm -hmm. so uh, just one last question uh, can we say or is it possible to say that the universe is predetermined i guess um this is uh, a question that has different layers uh, so I think the, so if you take the standard um, traditional physics view of thinking about stuff, you would say that um, 
there is a set of initial conditions for the universe. These are set. And uh, then the universe is just uh, unfolding along a specific trajectory according to whatever dynamics we have. And like, you know, especially even if this dynamics contains probabilities in it, it's still true that at fundamental level, at least if we follow quantum theory and GR the way we know them, um, there is an underlying deterministic dynamical equation that says how the whole universe is proceeding along some trajectory, which um, is, in a sense, I would say, yes, the universe is predetermined in this way. But the um, insight that comes from the physics of Ken and Kant is that just providing these initial conditions and trajectories are not going to explain stuff that we see in the universe completely. So that's the um, supplementary bit of the explanation that comes um, and somehow overrules the fact that the universe is predetermined in that way, in the sense that, again, the same way that the transistor in my earlier example is predetermined, so it's got the value zero, um, that was predetermined by the initial conditions of the computation. But it's still true that to explain why it's zero, you have to invoke this other type of explanation that involves counterfactual. It involves thinking of what uh, would have happened to the computation if that transistor had been one, for example. And so likewise, um, I think the explanation through counterfactuals adds a layer of, of um, explanatory material that is useful and necessary uh, even if you buy this idea that the universe is predetermined through you know, whatever initial conditions happen to had uh, at the start. So in that sense, I think the counterfactual explanations are like supplementing the current laws of motion. And hopefully they will also be useful to say in what way the universe is predetermined in the sense that they will allow us to find a set of allowed supplementary or boundary or initial conditions um, in a way helping us in this search for a good cosmological theory that explains the origin of the universe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the book is again The Science of Ken and Kent, A Physicist's Journey Through the Land of Counterfactuals. I will be leaving a link to it in the description box of the interview. So Dr. Marletto, just before we go, where can people find you on the internet? Um, so I think I have my um, research website, which is uh, constructotheory.org. And then there is my personal website, which is chiaramaletto.com. And um, so either, either are a good place to start. And I'm always happy to answer questions if you know people want to write them. Um, so please do contact me. OK, so Dr. Marletto, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you again for coming on the show. Likewise, thank you, Ricardo, for the invitation. Thanks. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been doing the channel for more than three years now. And it is thanks to people like you that it's been running for so long. And so if you like what I'm doing, please pay a visit to my Patreon page or to PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of the interview. And to consider making a pledge there, support the show. And otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share, share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingart, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Yevan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslan Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Eines, 
Sam, uh, Mark Smith, J.W. João Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yacila Dez Araújo, Idan Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Miran B., Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Max Bailby, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Alan or uh, Al Orwitz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Afzal, my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Kian Gilligan, Sergio Adriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Venegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardos France, and Niroban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.